Hello, I'm, my name is Kathy Franz. I'm a professor of chemistry at Duke University, and today we'll talk a little bit about inorganic chemistry. So what is inorganic chemistry? You could probably come up with a lot of answers to that question. So let's focus on just a literal meaning. One, it's not organic. So that begs the question, what's organic chemistry? And here we can really take, again, a literal meaning and maybe a more chemical meaning. So if we take it literally from its word, we can say it's, not, it's from an organism, so it's a living thing. Or if we want to take a chemistry definition, we'll say organic chemistry is, are carbon-based compounds. OK, so then we're left with the definition for inorganic chemistry that it must be not living and not carbon. OK, so just to make sure that you're breathing, take a deep breath. <sighs> what happened in that breath? Again, a couple of things happened. You breathed in mostly nitrogen, but some oxygen also. And what happens to that oxygen? Well, there's a lot of inorganic chemistry involved in that. But at the very end of the day, that oxygen has to be reduced all the way to water. And it takes our electron, it takes like four electrons that come really from the food you eat. And, turn, and that goes into water. So here's our reaction. Oxygen, O2, four electrons, four protons, and we get two molecules of water. Couple of questions. Is it organic? Is it living? So now we have one of the world's most important reactions, and it's not organic, but it is living. And this is inorganic chemistry. Now let's take another look at this reaction in terms of where it happens. So here's a protein called cytochrome C oxidase. It's a membrane protein. That's what those squiggly lines are on the side with the orange dots. That's the lipid membrane of your mitochondrion. And that big protein is cytochrome C oxidase. And if you zoom into the center, you'll see a couple other things in there. You'll see the O2. You can see where that goes into the middle of the protein. And if we look into that active site, you see more inorganic chemistry. So here's an iron porphyrin. The iron is the green dot in the middle of the porphyrin ring. And underneath that is a copper surrounded by six nitrogen donor atoms on histidines. Those are amino acid side chains on the protein. And oxygen is going to bind in between those two metal centers and ultimately turn into water. There's another inorganic site, another metal cofactor that's on cytochrome C oxidase. And that's up here, a two copper center. So this brown, bronze colored or copper colored spheres are the two coppers. And again, it has amino acid side chains that hold that copper center into place. So here's just two small examples of metallic cofactors found in a protein that's involved in an essential life process that's not organic, but it is living. So now let's take a look at the rest of the periodic table. If we said that organic chemistry was carbon-based and inorganic chemistry is non-carbon-based, we have a lot of elements to deal with in inorganic chemistry. So here's our periodic table of the elements. And we'll start with the bulk biological elements. These are the things like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, then the um, metal ions like sodium, magnesium, potassium, and calcium. Of course, hydrogen. So those are the bulk metals, or bulk elements. Now we'll look at the elements that are essential for a wide range of bacteria, plants, you and me. And you'll see that we go mostly across the whole first row of the transition elements. And we have a lot of the rest of the P block that gets filled in. But notice not all of the P block. So then we have uh, elements that are essential or may be essential for some species, but not necessarily all. And you'll notice on this list, we have a couple. Some of these are still somewhat controversial. They, they might be essential for some strange bacteria that live in ocean vents, um, but they might not be essential for all organisms. And then we have another set that inorganic chemists are also play with. And these are elements that can be used in medicine or diagnostics, but they're not necessarily naturally occurring. And here we have a list that's growing. So chemists can be quite creative. And a lot of these elements have different kinds of properties. And people take advantage of those to do a lot of different things. So here are just a couple of the examples. Uh, as one famous example is platinum that's used in a widely used anti-cancer agent, cisplatin. But there are a lot of others, and there are more on their way. And then, of course, there are ones that are poisonous. And here, again, I haven't covered in everything, but the poison all depends on the dose. So really, any, most of these elements can be toxic at some concentration. Uh, but some of, this, some of the other toxicities you'll recognize, things like mercury or thallium or lead, we know are inherently pretty toxic. And we don't have an essential function for those elements. So you can see that 
inorganic chemistry has a lot to do with life and living things, and inorganic chemists who do biological inorganic chemistry have the whole periodic table to cover. Here again, we're going to, we'll look at just a couple of examples of metalloenzymes or metallobiomolecules that have, have metal cofactors. We already talked about cytochrome C oxidase and the iron and copper that's found uh, at the active site of, of that molecule. But also on this list, we can, there's uh, the ribozyme, and that has metals that can hold it into place. So there's an example of nucleic acids with metal cofactors. You can see that, that the, the purpose of the metal ions there is to hold some charge balance and maintain structure. So that's one of the functions of metals that can be used in inorganic chemistry or in biological chemistry. Also on this list, or on, on this just small example, uh, we see urease. Urease is a nickel enzyme, and you'll see that in the structure there are two green spheres. Those are the two nickel atoms. Urease was one of the first enzymes that was solved by X-ray crystallography, and that's where they discovered the two nickel sites. If you want to know what the, what the uh, chemical reaction is that urease does, here it is. It hydrolyzes urea to give CO2 and ammonia. And this is an enzyme, it's not found in humans, but it is found in, found in some bacteria. And they happen to be found in bacteria that live in your gut. So these are the Helobacter pylori bacteria that causes ulcers. It has to live in an acidic environment. But if it has a lot of urease, it forms a lot of ammonia, and that acts to stabilize and buffer their system so that they can survive in an acidic environment. And the last example that we'll look at a little bit is up at the top, and that's hemocyanin. And you'll see there are two yellow-brown uh, connections. Those are really the copper atoms that are drawn in that structure. So here's a copper-containing uh, enzyme again. This one's found in arthropods, and it carries oxygen. So you and I, we use hemoglobin to carry our oxygen. That's actually an iron center that binds oxygen. Here, hemocyanin in arthropods uses copper, and it binds oxygen in between. So you see the red line that's between those two coppers. That's the O2 that's coordinated to hemocyanin. So what are arthropods? So here's one example, and these are horseshoe crabs, very old uh, organisms, and they don't have red blood like you and I have from hemoglobin. They have blue blood, and the blue blood comes from that hemocyanin protein with the two coppers that binds oxygen and gives a really nice blue color. So now we can summarize many of the functional roles for, for many of the biological roles for inorganic elements that are used in biology. We haven't looked at all of these, but hopefully you'll get a little bit of an appetite to start looking for more. So one are simple things like charge balance and electrolytic conductivity, structure and templating, things that hold other things together. Think about your bones made of calcium and phosphate. That's one example. But you can also see smaller examples in proteins where a metal cofactor could help with a, uh, with a structural feature. Signaling molecules, so these are molecules like calcium or NO that have to come on and off and cause some biological signal in, inside a cell or between cells. And then there are things that you'll be hearing a lot about in general chemistry, Bronsted acid base buffering or Lewis acid base catalysis. So if you're looking at those general principles, think about where in biology you might need those and what are the kinds of elements that are used to, to carry out those processes. Electron transfer is another example. We saw that in cytochrome C oxidase, where we had those four electrons. Where do they come from? How do they go where they're going? Metal cofactors have a lot to do with that. And atom group transfer, like the oxygen in hemocyanin or the oxygen in your hemoglobin, that has to be transferred from one thing to another, and metal ions do a lot of that transfer. And redox catalysis. You'll probably be studying some of those kinds of reactions also, both from small molecules, but also think about the biological roles. And there are a lot of metal ions that can do redox catalysis. Energy storage, how do you store energy in chemical bonds, and what are the inorganic components of that? And biomineralization, like your bones and calcium. But next time you're at the beach and you see the shells, think about how do those form? How do those minerals form in those structures uh, that we think of as being inorganic minerals, but they're found in a very biological setting?